Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker. Play the Opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the Opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Then on Wednesday at the Supreme Court, the justices took up a case called Atchison Hotels v. Lawfer. This is a case involving Deborah Lawfer, a woman who, after a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, needed a wheelchair to get around. And under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Justice Department in 2010 issued a regulation that requires hotel owners to provide information on their websites, by telephone, in person, any way that they allow people to book rooms that provides enough detail to reasonably permit individuals with disabilities to assess independently whether a given hotel or guest room meets his or her accessibility needs. And Kim, what is so interesting about this case, I think, is that Deborah Lawfer considers herself an ADA tester. So she has made a practice of going around the internet looking for hotel websites. The one that she ended up finding that is involved in this case happened to be in Maine. But she finds a hotel that does not have the accessibility information on the website. And then she files a lawsuit, whether or not she ever intends to visit that hotel at all. So part of what's before the court here is a question of standing. Do you have the kind of injury that you need to go to court if you are looking at a website that doesn't have the accessibility information, even if you don't have any interest in going to that particular hotel? Yeah, what's really, really fascinating about this case is it's it's exposed this kind of racket that's been going on out there in which lawyers will basically put together these cookie cutter lawsuits, as it were, or claims, complaints, ADA suits against these hotels and their owners claiming that they all lack the requisite disability information. They find someone like a law firm to act as the the named person who's filing the complaint. They send these things off. And, and it's really interesting. You can't necessarily get monetary damages out of this, but the lawyers are entitled to $10,000 in fees per claim when they go to do these settlements with these hotels. And it has become this kind of mill of these ADA tester suits. Officially, also, these tester plaintiffs aren't supposed to be getting paid to do this. But this is, in fact, why this case has become really fascinating, because there have been allegations involved here of misconduct by attorneys and misconduct or questionable uh, issues about who's actually making money out of this. And it's just sort of one of those things where whenever the lawyers are around, you can bet that they're going to somehow try to pervert the real purposes of what a law says in order to cash that out themselves. And this lawsuit, which is now in front of the Supreme Court, has really, really exposed that. And we're going to find out if the high court's going to continue to allow it. To that point, this summer after the justices took this case, Deborah Lawfer filed a suggestion of mootness before the Supreme Court, disclosing that one of the lawyers she had worked with to file these lawsuits had been disciplined by a federal court in Maryland, saying that he had filed boilerplate lawsuits, including the same typos and misspellings uniformly against small hotels. And then regardless of how long that filing took, he would send these small hotel operators a letter, a generous offer to settle for up to $10,000 in attorney's fees. And what makes this even more interesting then is that the law firm was paying an investigator $650 a pop to create these expert ADA reports showing that these websites were out of compliance with the reservation rule. And this investigator, according to this disciplinary ruling, is, quote, the former boyfriend of Lawfer's daughter and the father of one of Lawfer's grandchildren. Now, along with this suggestion of mootness this summer, she filed a declaration saying that this investigator has not given her any money or anything else of value. And so she is saying that there's no real direct financial connection there, despite what how it may appear. But because this may distract from the case and this work to enforce the ADA, her lawyer said that she would drop not only this case, but all of her pending cases under the ADA. So the other question at the Supreme Court is whether this case is now moot for their purposes. 
And we have a clip here of Justice Elena Kagan taking up that question. When you look at a case that's dead as a doornail several times over, you know, uh, the, the, the case has been dismissed by the plaintiff. Uh, the defendant is totally different. The defendant's website, everybody agrees, is now in compliance with the ADA. So this is like dead, dead, dead in all the ways that something can be dead. The reference there to the hotel operator being different is that Atchison Hotels has apparently sold this main inn that was originally part of the case. They say that they can still defend their interests because they are still in the hotel business and could be sued by other ADA plaintiffs. But Alicia, I think this is a a difficult question for the justices because if parties can come before the court and then immediately drop their lawsuits, their cases, when it looks like they have unfavorable facts and are in line to get an unfavorable ruling, it leads to potential manipulation of the Supreme Court's docket. And we've seen that in the past with the Second Amendment case out of New York, where New York tried to change the rules in order to avoid getting the ruling that eventually came down in that case. And to the extent that the justices allow this kind of thing to happen, even if it meets the normal tests of mootness, it does suggest to me that plaintiffs are going to start playing that game more often. Right. And so I think there is a concern about the gamesmanship manipulating the court stocking. And I think the chief tried to get to that. And he raised an interesting point during the oral arguments that normally that courts consider the question of standing before they consider actual whether something is moot. And standing, again, going back, it's whether some plaintiff suffers a concrete and particularized injury that can be traced to a defendant's action. And so if you were to consider strictly the question of standing, which really is the question before the court, I had argued that Laffer did not have standing. But the question where the liberals seem to want to go on this, and I think some of the conservatives are a little concerned too, because they've been sticklers on this issue of mootness and, and, and standing in the past, is, well, maybe we should enforce our own strict principles and, and just dismiss this case. But you mentioned the guns case, but I think there have been a couple of others that are apropos where the federal government has tried to kind of dismiss cases and that one of them was the the Sackett, the EPA case that the Supreme Court actually heard last term regarding the extent of the EPA's and Army Corps' power to enforce the Clean Water Act and over um, their jurisdiction over a dearth lot that was bought by an Idaho couple. And the EPA basically said that we're not going to actually go after them anymore. We're not going to enforce these penalties. So therefore, this case is moot. And actually, the Ninth Circuit said, no, 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 it's not moot because you guys could still do this, even though you're saying you're, you're not. And similarly, back in the West Virginia v. EPA case, the the Biden administration tried to argue, well, that that case was moot. And that case, if you recall, was about whether the constitutionality and the legality of the Obama clean power plan. And the Biden administration said, we're rewriting the rule and we don't really intend to write it in the same way that Obama did. And therefore, this case is moot. And again, the Supreme Court dismissed that argument saying, well, no, you could still resurrect it or resurrect it in some form. You have not disclaimed your essentially authority to do it. Therefore, it's not moot. So I think there is a lot and those are just two cases. But you mentioned the gun case as well. There are many cases where the Supreme Court has been very reluctant to dismiss a a case for mootness, lest that encourage uh, more gamesmanship in the the federal docket. Thank you, Alicia and Kim. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button, and we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch. (laughs) 